Nintendo Pirate Perspectives roll on with issue number 63 for August of 1994, and just when you thought the NES was out of the picture, the editors pull it back in! Albeit for a game that didn't actually receive a US release, but hey. Now what game? Keep watching to find out. Stunt Race FX is the cover game, and I talked about it way back in episode 75, about nine months ago. I'd be confused and disappointed with this cover, were not for the fact that after numerous issues without a diorama cover, we finally have a diorama cover again, and what a wonderful cover it is. Really good art and uh, clay sculpting and that sort of thing. I'm glad to see this again. In past installments of the letters column, we've seen letters singing the praises of the durability of the Game Boy. This issue has a letter praising the durability of Game Boy cartridges. In this case, we have a writer who accidentally left two carts outside in the snow for three months, and they still work. Impressive. We have our cover game first off, and since we've already reviewed this game, I'm not going to be covering it here. Of note, we don't have any maps of the tracks this issue, just notes on each level. Next up is Lord of the Rings Volume 1. This is a Super Nintendo RPG adapting the first half of the Fellowship of the Ring, pretty much through the minds of Moria. At this pace, had they finished the story, this probably would have taken about six games. That said, they didn't finish the story, either on the Super Nintendo or on the PC. The PC Lord of the Rings games from Interplay in this series covered the first two books, but did not get to Return of the King, and covered more material in each game than the cartridge release did. The guide is reliant on some info from the manual, presumably as a anti-used slash anti-rental measure. The description of the article makes the game seem grindy, with a lot of fetch quests. Lord of the Rings is kind of a mess, as an action RPG is concerned. The controls are fine enough when you're controlling one character, but things get progressively messier as more characters are involved. It feels like the game designers didn't put any work into testing the game's AI and making sure that it worked, at least for your party members. This is aggravated by the fact that the game features permadeath, so if any of the fellowship goes down, then that's it. They're dead. Worse, the game uses a password system instead of letting you save your game. I can only really think of two reasons to do this. Maybe three. Either the cartridge would have cost more than they felt the audiences could afford with backups, or they were hoping that by using a password system, it would be easier for players to carry their progress over to the sequel. Or, they were hoping that players would figure out how to hack the password system to make it so that you are have any fall, any members of the Fellowship, should they be killed, you bring them back to life using the password information. In any case, all of this is aggravated by the fact that, well, it's a long password, it's a really long password. RPGs on the NES when they had passwords were they were very tedious and clunky and here it's even more so. In either case, no matter what their reasoning was for doing this, the decision was a bad decision. We move on to a action sort of fighting brawler game with King of the Monsters 2. This is a isometric kaiju themed brawler. We have three playable characters covered in the article. Atomic Guy, who appears to be an XP of Ultraman. Super Geon, an XP of Godzilla, and Cyber Wu, who appears to be a King Kong XP. Or maybe be, maybe a reference to the Chinese Shaw Brothers version of King Kong, a mighty Peking man. There are also some notes on the enemies. Now, King of the Monsters generally feels and plays more like a brawler than a fighting game, which honestly fits more with the general style of the game that is trying to name like kaiju movies. In kaiju movies, you have the military trying to destroy the kaiju, and then whichever monster your hero kaiju is fighting against. The balance is generally pretty good, but I wasn't able to find much of a move list, nor was I able to particularly pull off any special moves, which was disappointing because you want to have your big flashy special moves, especially when that's giant monsters doing them. Additionally, while well, this is a decent port of a co-op brawler, with some rebalancing done to reflect that the system is on home consoles, it's also a console brawler that has power down items in addition to power up items, which is pretty frustrating. Those who work in arcade brawlers do 
make you feed the system more quarters, but again, you're at for a home release of a brawler, you're not feeding quarters into your Super Nintendo. So why have those artificial difficulty measures in there? Next is the death and rebirth of Superman. A brawler based on the comic book storyline, which appears to let you play not only as Superman, but also each of the aspirants to the throne. The Eradicator, Steel, Superboy, and, Cyborg, and the Cyborg. Death and Rebirth of Superman is a brawler designed for home consoles first. And because of that, it does a whole bunch of things that are the essential for, are essentials for home versions of brawlers. Unlimited continues, and at the very least, the inclusion of a health refill code. That said, the game was not without some very real flaws. First off, it has a few issues when it comes to executing the game's core, core concept. The game is based around, well, a pretty clear-cut comic storyline, and admit one that is pretty conductive to adaptation mode to a brawler, with one significant difference. Superman's fights with Doomsday need to feel like something more than just a boss fight, which is how they're executed in this game. In the comic, the focus of Superman's fight with Doomsday is just on Doomsday. Everyone else gets out of the way. Anyone who would might otherwise consider taking a pot shot at Superman gets lost because this is a big enough of a thing. Doomsday is a very dangerous threat in his own right. Its own right. Doomsday has no gender. Um, their own right. And Superman is just absolutely, as the storyline goes on, cutting loose more and more with his fight against Doomsday, just trying to put him down, which means get trying to get your shot in is going to get you clobbered much more than you would otherwise if you were fighting Superman. And additionally, as the storyline goes on, and the fight gets more and more spectacular, the number of panels per page in each issue drops in a very deliberate countdown. By the time you reach the issue where Superman dies, every page is a full page splash. And you can't replicate this in game form. Focus on a series of flights with Doomsday, with the backdrop changing from the farms around Metropolis to entering the suburbs and finally into the city, which becomes then Battle Den. You're changing the background sprites and eventually changing Superman's sprite as he becomes more disheveled. If you want to take this one step further, incorporate the uh, Justice League um, International taking on Doomsday. Maybe for the first portion of the fight, have Superman be able to call in the JLI as striker characters and um, have them do some damage, but maybe not so much, and that, and so forth and so on as the fight goes on. And you're changing background sprites, and you're changing Superman's sprite as he comes more disheveled. You're changing Doomsday's sprite as that costume thing he has on. When you see, when you first see him, this sort of spacesuit type thing, he gets tore off him and shows the craggy, bony creature underneath. And it makes the super the fight against Doomsday feel as epic as it is in the comics, as opposed to in the game where. Doomsday is throwing a horde of generic goons at you to wear you down before the big fight. Now, again, in the storyline, there is a bit before you, the Doomsday shows up in the first place where he's, Superman's going into the underground of uh, uh, Metropolis and fighting some guys down there. And that gives you a, a basic generic beat-em-up level. And there's plenty of material after this for generic beat-em-up levels, but not with Doomsday. Throwing generic mooks in with Doomsday makes the fight feel cheap. Other than that, the game works well, and Blizzard, the game developer, does a great job in putting together an engaging brawler in a way that some of the other Western developed brawlers, brawlers that I've played in the past, doesn't quite work. Got real props for that. Continuing with the licensed games, we have an American tale, Fievel Goes West, a platformer based on the Don Bluth film. Well, I admit, I haven't seen either of those films, and I should really rectify that someday. Anyway, you get a map of the first stage, and notes on the subsequent stages, though the through the game's conclusion. For a video game based on a children's film, this game is punishingly hard, and it's not because of the platform. 
The platforming is just floaty enough to not allow for mid-air correction, and there aren't any problems with clipping through platforms. No, the problem is the enemies. Enemies are bullet, or rather cork, sponges, and while you have very little health, and their sprites are big enough that pacifist runs aren't the optimal strategy, I get giving the carrots large sprites and making them hard to beat and very intimidating that's in keeping with the source material. You're a mouse, your opponents are cats. Animal that eat you. But maybe, instead, design the game where you can play the game better in a pacifist run, because that's also in keeping with the source material. Especially considering that Fival is meant to be the equivalent in terms of age, physical ability, worldly knowledge, and maturity to a human five-year-old. Maybe six or seven. Our second brawler of this issue is a sequel, Sonic Blast Man 2. I covered the first game on episode 60, which feels like forever ago. Anyway, this game has two more playable characters, supporting the trinity of brawler playstyles, Speedster, Balanced, and Bruiser. The article has maps of the first three stages, and notes on stages 4 through 5. Sonic Blast Man 2 is a fairly well-balanced brawler, with unlimited continues, two-player, good controls, and a good lineup of characters. If I have a complaint about the game, it's from the second level onwards, it's a loop. The game introduces a selection of enemies that will do a lot of damage to you when struck, or give you restore sort of items based on color, but you can't proceed until they're defeated, which means if you can't or aren't able to throw an enemy at them or engage in some other sort of ranged attack, you're going to take a big hit. The Secret of Mana Guide continues, this time covering the game through the fight with the Vampire. In classified information, we have invincibility and level skip codes for Wolfenstein 3D. The now playing column is actually coming up earlier this issue. The also rans this time include R-Type 2, which I actually covered back in episode 75, Speed Racer, Operation Thunderbolt, Fighter's History, Impossible Mission 2025, and the Game Boy versions of World Cup USA 94 and Elite Soccer. We have an article this issue on the making of Shaq Fu. I heard about the game and its infamous reputation, but I hadn't heard that it was from Delphine, the studio responsible for Out of This World and Flashback, which makes for an incredibly dramatic tonal shift. Not surprisingly, considering their pedigree, Shaq Fu uses rotoscoped animation heavily. Our sole NES game this issue is the NES version of Beauty and the Beast, with maps of all four levels. Unfortunately, this game never got a US release. It was released in Europe, in a manner that was optimized for PAL, but not in the US, which is a bummer. Presumably, someone was working on porting this game to the US, so there's probably a prototype somewhere, but it hasn't been dumped yet. So, this is the part of this episode where I make the call that if you have any development materials for this game, Please get in touch with the Video Game History Foundation because... That belongs in a museum! Moving into Game Boy games, we have Cool Spot, a portable version of the Super Nintendo game, though it has some of the levels shuffled around. Remember all that stuff I've been talking about when it comes to balancing field of view and Game Boy games and the size of sprites? Yeah, Cool Spot doesn't get that right at all. It tries to maintain the same sprite proportion and level size as the console versions, and it just doesn't work. Worse, it feels like they're pushing the Game Boy hardware to such a degree that I feel like I'm running into serious performance hits while I'm playing the game. The game. It's a bummer, because as far as these sort of licensed food product mascot games are concerned, and I'm kind of surprised at the genre, Cool Spot is one of my favorites. It's been a while since the last Simpsons game we reviewed, and we have a new one this issue with Itchy and Scratchy Miniature Golf Madness. The game is a combined miniature golf game and platformer. The article has a list of power-ups, along with maps of the first three levels. Miniature Golf Madness is a very bad game for a variety of reasons. I will say, to the game's credit, that the concept, a platformer based around miniature golf, is novel. However, where the game falls down is in the execution. First off, there's problems with fighting off Itchy. Itchy often comes out of the blue, and your attack arc is just enough that it makes it really hard to actually counter attacks from him. Second, for some really stupid reason, 
Levels are designed in a manner where there is a really difficult and obnoxious obstacle to overcome right before the hole. You'll end up eating up large quantities of your in your strokes while you try to figure out a strategy to get past it while actually getting the ball in the hole. I think the most frustrating part of all of this, but I suspect the reason I've seen never seen anyone else try this concept, is because this game messed it up that bad that everyone else assumed that, oh, this is this can't be done, it's terrible, don't try it. And that's a bummer. Our final game of the issue is Robocop vs. Terminator for the Game Boy, based on the comic by Dark Horse. The article has maps the first, second, and fifth levels, but only notes for the third and fourth. I wonder why they skipped those levels. Robocop vs. Terminator does away with some of the more obnoxious elements of the difficulty of earlier Robocop games, like how much damage you took from being hit, and how few and far between health regenerating items were in the level environments. Unfortunately, it also adds a whole bunch of really obnoxious platforming into the game, which makes the levels longer than they need to be. Honestly, I think the kind of game that would work best for the original Robocop would be something like a belt scroller like Kung Fu, except you have a gun and they add an ability to block some incoming shots if you get if your reflexes are right. In the top 20, Super Metroid is in the top spot on the Super NES, and Street Fighter 2 Turbo is approaching the top 5, but Mortal Kombat still has it beat. In Pack Watch, we had screenshots last issue and the play it loud marketing sample thing, but this issue we have a title to go with the images we had of Donkey Kong Country. We also have a look at the Super Nintendo version of Mortal Kombat 2, which now has the blood intact. Wrapping up the issue is a special report from Summer CES, done in a slightly more restrained version of the Play It Loud style. The article covers the upcoming arcade versions of Cruisin' USA and Killer Instinct, along with the Super Nintendo version of The Lion King. My pick of the issue is Sonic Blast Man 2. A strong improvement on the first game in a lot of respects, both in terms of supporting a variety of play types with the characters and also by supporting two-player co-op. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.